Okay, everyone, and welcome back. So in this video, we are going to be talking about this um, more in depth about types of errors you might make in a classification setting, in particular talking about precision and recall. Now, even though we'll be talking about this in terms of something about classification, this week we're really going to be starting our new case study on document retrieval, talking about how do you represent more abstract concepts. And one of the things that we'll think about commonly with document retrieval is this notion of precision and recall. So in this video, I want to recap some of these notions of different types of classification errors. And then in class on Monday, we'll actually start our new case study and then talk about how this notion of precision and recall play out there. So in this video, I want to start by talking about kind of a blast in the past when we introduced classification at the beginning of week. We talked about how um, just minimizing classification error isn't always enough to know if your classifier is actually good. In particular, if you have a class imbalance, then it's entirely possible to have a very simple classifier that can get high accuracy because it predicts the majority class. And so sometimes we might need to dive into what types of errors my model might make. If there is a class imbalance, maybe we should look at making sure that the class that's less represented doesn't have a disproportionate number of mistakes uh, upon it. And so we want to maybe think about other types of errors. In particular, we talked about this notion of a confusion matrix, looking at this notion of a true positive versus a, um, a true positive versus a true negative. Remember, in, these, in this terminology, the true or false is about whether or not your prediction was correct, and then the label associated with it is what your prediction was. So a true positive is you predicted positive and you were correct. A true negative is you predicted negative and you were correct. Alternatively, a false negative is when you predict negative but you were wrong. And a false positive is when you predict positive and you are wrong. So these are all statements about what you predicted. And then the thing at the beginning tells you whether or not you're right. And so we might want to look at these statistics to look into, well, is my model performing in a way that I want it to? Is it making maybe a similar amount of false positives or false negatives? Or depending on context, you might care about one type of error versus another. And we talked about and in this slide that I showed you kind of way back when, a few weeks back, I showed you a bunch of things that you can compute. These are all different numbers that use those values in the confusion matrix and tell you a different story. Now, today we're really going to be focusing on these, these ones called precision and recall. But before I get to those, I also want to talk a little bit about this true positive rate and this um, false positive rate. Remember, the tr when we talk about these rates, they're always kind of out of what the true labels are. So a false positive rate in this example is the number of false positives divided by the total number of actually negative examples. It's asking of all of the examples with the label negative, what fraction of them did you falsely label as positive? And a true positive rate is the opposite. All the things that are truly, uh, sorry, of all the things that are actually positive, what ratio of them did you predict being positive? So what, um, one thing you might imagine is if you made a classifier that you wanted to predict, we'll come back to that notion of precision and recall later in this video. But what you might imagine if you're thinking about something like logistic regression or our threshold classifier, um, you can control that false positive rate and that true positive rate by changing which threshold you use for your prediction. So in this example, I'm just gonna talk about the score classifier. So one that it's our linear classifier that predicts a score. We're not talking about logistic regression yet, but everything I'll say here applies. So if you want to make sure that you never make a false positive using our linear classifier that just uses score, you never want to make a false positive, meaning you never make a false positive mistake. What you could do is you could always predict negative. If you always predict negative, you'll never make a false positive. It's a kind of trivial way of doing it, right? You'll never predict positive, which means you'll never falsely predict positive. 
And one way we can implement this is if we consider our score classifier, instead of predicting positive if the score was greater than zero, we can predict uh, positive if the score is greater than some number alpha. We can choose a threshold where we want the positive prediction to happen. And if you want to make sure that you never predict positive, you always predict negative, what you could do is you could set alpha. If you make your threshold infinity, you say you have to have an infinite score in order to predict positive, well, then you're never going to predict positive. That means you'll always predict negative. This is an extreme case, but if you really, really, really want to avoid false positives, this is one way to satisfy that, right? Alternatively, if you always want to avoid false negatives, one way of easily achieving that is always predict positive. If you always predict positive, then there's nothing you could really do. You can never make a false negative. You'll never predict negative. You won't have a false negative. In terms of our threshold classifier, one way of achieving that is predict positive if you have a score greater than or equal to negative infinity. Any number is negative infinity, so we'll always predict positive. So these are two extremes. These are not things you probably would actually use in practice because they're kind of overly simplistic. But in general, this is setting up a sort of trade-off that this threshold classifier that you could use kind of adjusts how much you might care about true positives or true negative, or sorry, or false positives. Um, and so one thing that people sometimes will look at is this thing called an ROC curve. Uh, I believe it stands for receiver optimal control or something. I, I don't exactly know where it's from, but ROC curves are one way of trying to visualize different types of. So an ROC curve looks at, it makes a graph that has two axes. On the y-axis, we have our true positive rate. The count of our true positives divided by the number of positive And on the x-axis, we have our, a false positive rate. This axis, a false positive rate is the positive divided by the number of negatives. And what we'll do is we'll make a plot of these models for various thresholds. So before I talk about this threshold, one thing I should point out is that you can imagine that up here in this kind of the x-axis being at value zero and the y-axis being at value one, this is the best possible model. It's one that makes 100% true positive rate and no false positives. In some sense, this is an optimal model. It never makes a false positive prediction gets every true positive correct. This might not be entirely true because we're not looking at the of, uh, um, of these false, uh, of any type of error, but in these types of errors, this is in some sense the best model. Now, alternatively, you can imagine a really crappy model down here. A one, uh, actually, I'm gonna... Down here, we'd have our worst. One that has a really high false positive rate, meaning a lot, a big fraction of things that are negative, we actually predict positive. And it has a very low true positive rate. All the things that were actually positive, we didn't predict many of them. And in fact, when it's zero, none of them positively. Now, what you can imagine, assuming you have balanced classes, that everything is kind of, um, uh, or everything is well balanced, you can imagine a model that might live in the middle. One that has 0.5 for the false positive rate and 0.5 for the true positive rate. This would be a random guesser. One that's just kind of randomly guessing positive labels. And you would expect, assuming balanced classes, that half the time you'd be getting the positive examples right and half the time you'd get, be getting the negative examples. And so you'd expect to have something like a 50-50. Uh, uh, for these rates, kind of in this random guesser. Now, what you could do is you could bias that guesser. You can also bias that guesser to predict more positives or predict more negatives, making it more, so it doesn't have to be 50-50 prediction, but maybe 90% of the time it predicts positive and other times it doesn't. If you consider that random guesser, maybe as you kind of increase the rate it predicts positive, you'd imagine that both your true positive rate 
and your false positive rate would increase. If it's more likely to predict positive, your true positive rate should go up and your false positive rate should go up because you're predicting positive for more and more examples. So as you kind of predict positive more, both the false positive rate and the true positive rate increase. And alternatively, the amount of time you predict positive, both the true positive rate and the false positive rate. And so you could imagine a random guesser that's kind of parameterized by how often it predicts positive, how likely it is to predict positive. You can imagine it living on this line that tells you for how frequently you're guessing positive, what are the false positive rates and true? This is not one model. This is many, many models. These models that are randomly guessing. Now, most models don't do complete random guessing. You would hope that with our score classifier, we're doing something at least slightly smarter. And so what you'll actually find is in most scenarios, when you plot for different thresholds that alpha score classifier, or predicting score of x greater than some alpha, we end up finding a curve that looks something like this. Maybe I'll draw that. Curve that looks something like this. down here. This is the case where we make alpha. If you set that threshold equal to infinity, you are never going to predict positive, which means your true positive rate and your false positive rate will be zero. You never predicted positive. Alternatively, you can imagine on the other end of the spectrum. When uh, that's. You can imagine at this point, the model that uses threshold negative infinity that's always predicted positive has a high false positive rate and a high true positive. In these two extremes, they're kind of the opposite models, ones that always predict positive or always predict negative. Now, in real life, you usually have this knob you can threshold. And your true positive rate and false positive rate will change depending on what that threshold is. And one thing that we like to do sometimes is try to visualize what this looks like. And you might visualize this ROSE curve plotting out what is the true positive rate, what is the false positive rate um, for many different settings of this threshold. Now, this can be useful because it can help you identify when you're trying to compare different types of models, which one might be better across these different choices for how sensitive you want the model to be. For example, if you come up with some much fancier model, maybe the score classifier 2.0 that uses a bunch of different features and a bunch of fancier math to get a better model. You might imagine that you might find an ROC curve. Uh, actually, running out of colors here pretty quickly. You might find that the thresholds rece always result in higher true positive rates and false positive rates than our original red model. And if that's the case, no matter where you're operating on this kind of which threshold you use, this, model's, this blue model is always doing better. Now, in, in reality, what usually happens is it's not always clear that one model is better than another. They might cro cross over each other, in which case, depending on if you care more about true positives or false positives, you might choose one model over another. And we'll discuss a little bit more about that in this next part of the video. But that's the big idea. Sometimes people like to compute these ROC curves. And they're looking at true positive rates and false positive rates. One thing I'll highlight, and we're not going to spend too much time on ROC curves in particular. Today, we're going to focus on a type of plot. Is there all different types of plots for different errors you might find? And you have to pay particular attention to what the axes are labeled. In this case, true positive rate and false positive. In the next part of this video, I'm going to show you a different looking graph with different axes. And look at different things. But a lot of the same ideas are there. Plotting one model or a, a family of models that are parameterized by something like a threshold. And you can see how are the error metrics you care about or accuracy metrics you care about affected by that. And you might report numbers based off. In particular, when you look at ROC curves, one particular value people generally report 
is this thing that we call an area under the curve. So people look at what is this area underneath this ROC curve? Call it AUC for area under the curve. And they report that as kind of something about their model. We won't go into how to interpret that or what that means, but I just wanted to mention that the AU, that area under the curve is a common metric that goes along with ROC. But I'm not going to worry too much about this. Okay. Now, what I want us to focus on are two slightly different notions of accuracy or, or, uh, or errors that we're going to focus on in our next case study about document retrieval. So remember that every context cares about different types of errors differently. And in the case of document retrieval, we generally focus on these two statistics that we I uh, briefly mentioned earlier. One called precision and other called recall. Precision, and th these uh, are shown on that earlier slide. I'll we'll talk about those formulas later. Precision is all about of the things that you actually predicted to be positive, what fraction of them were actually positive. And recall asks a slightly different question. Of all the things that actually were positive, how many of them did you correctly predict as positive? So precision is about how accurate your, um, your positive predictions are. And recall is about, did you find all of the things that actually were positive? They ask slightly different questions. That's really easy to confuse them. So let's walk through and try to do examples to understand. So precision is what fraction of the examples I predict positive were actually correct. So what you might do in our case of looking at sentiment of reviews, you might say, okay, of all the ones that I actually predicted as positive, what fraction of them actually were positive? And in this example, if I predicted six sentences to have positive sentiment, but only four of them actually were positive, we would have a precision of that's four out of six. So in general, our precision is the count of our true positives divided by the number of things we predicted to be positive, which is the sum of the true positives and the false positives. All the things I predicted positive, how many of them actually were positive? So ideally, your precision would be something like one, because you want all of the things that you predicted to actually predicted positive to actually be positive. Now, I want to note, you might wonder, what about things like of all the things you predicted negative? Those are also very valid, but in the context of document retrieval that we'll talk about, there's generally thousands or millions of documents only need to recommend a few of them. And so we're really interested in of the things you recommended, which one, how, what fraction of those are actually useful. And so that's generally why we care about precision. And Alternatively, you also might care about recall. Of the things that actually are positive, oh, sorry, actually, I should go back real quick. So that, in this case, 4 divided by 4 plus 2. Alternatively, you might care about recall. So recall is of the things that actually are positive. How many did we predict positive? And so recall is the count of the true positives divided by the actual number of positive examples. So how many things did I predict as positive? that actually were positive, divided by all the things that actually were positive. So recall is of the things that actually were really positive examples, what fraction of them did I actually predict as positive? And ideally, I want this to also be one, that I find all of the things that actually are positive. So in this example, if I have this classifier that made these predictions of positive and negative, and all the things with thumbs up are things that actually are positively then in this case, my recall would be, for example, that actually were positive that I labeled as positive, but there are two exam positive examples that I missed that I labeled as negative. So in this case, my recall would be 4 over 4 plus 2. In this case. So it just happens to be the case that my precision and recall were the same in both of these examples. That's not generally the case. Generally, you might find a kind of trade-off that exists between precision and recall. Note that there are trivial ways of getting 
high precision or getting high recall. If you want high recall, just always predict positive. That means of the, all the things that actually were positive, you predict positive for all of them. That's an easy way to get high recall. But if you do that, you won't have high precision because precision is of the things that you actually predicted positive, what fraction of them actually are positive. You predict positive for everything, that's gonna be a crap fraction. Now you can also make your precision high if you never predict positive. That means you'll never make a mistake, in which case you might say you have zero precision. Or sorry, uh, high precision. Um, because you never made any. So in general, precision and recall will exist on this trade-off. A very optimistic model, and by optimistic, I mean one that usually predicts positive, will have high recall but low precision. And a pessimistic model, one that usually predicts negative, will, uh, will have high precision but low recall. It has low recall because if you're usually predicting negative, you're gonna not flag a lot of the actual positive examples as being positive. But you'll have high precision because of the things that you predicted positive, a hopefully high fraction of them will actually be positive. And so in general, you'll have this balance between an optimistic model and a pessimistic model. In this case, the pessimistic model is a threshold model where our threshold is infinity. And an optimistic model is a threshold model where our threshold is negative infinity. And any threshold in between will result in different trade-offs between this precision and recall. So I think it might help to uh, um, think about this also in terms of logistic regression. The idea is exactly the same as our score classifier. If you're talking about controlling precision and recall for a score classifier, it's just the number that you use for your prediction. However, you can also do the same thing with logistic regression. You just change when you actually predict positive. Instead of predicting positive for a value of 0.5 or above, maybe use something like having some threshold t, or I guess I could have used alpha here. Same thing with logistic regression. You can control how optimistic or pessimistic you want by changing the rule that you use to make classification. So nothing fancy there, just exactly the same idea, but in the scale of logistic regression, our outputs are between zero and one. So we'll use some, a different variable to just describe, well, before I was outputting true or positive if it was more than 0.5, after we squish it with that sigmoid, now I'll just pick some number t between. And now I think it might help to think about a curve that looks kind of like the ROC curve. In theory, it's a graph and we plot two tricks on the sides, but in practice will look very different. That on one end of the have high recall but low precision. That's our very optimistic one that's using t equals zero in the case of logistic regression as its threshold. If you use t equals zero, that means you predict everything you see, no matter how small the probability of it being positive, you'll predict that it's positive. And this very optimistic model that always thinks things are positive will have high recall because of all the things that actually are positive, it will flag all of them as but the precision will be low. Maybe not zero. I think the one thing that gets a little confusing with this is the zeros. It's not going to actually be zero. It's whatever the base rate of positive examples is or our negative examples. But in general, you'll have a low precision. Alternatively, imagine a very pessimistic model. One that always says no. It's always negative. In this case, you'd be using a threshold like one. You'd only predict positive if the output probability is greater than one, which isn't possible. In that case, you'll have low recall because of all the things actually are positive, you won't predict them being positive, but you might have high precision. Because you didn't predict many things as being positive, then the things that you made mistakes on in that pool are none. So you might imagine then in that context that we do something a bit weird, that in the context where we're talking about precision, precision being, um, of the things actually count of true positive divided by the count of true positive plus the count of false positive. In this case, if you make no positive predictions, this would be something like zero out of zero, which maybe is not defined. We're gonna cheat a bit and call that one. The reason being precision is trying to get at what fraction of the things you predicted positive did you make mistakes on? 
And in that context, since you didn't make predictions on anything, you don't have any mistakes. And so we'll just say that you have a precision. It's a bit weird, but that's just. And then for any threshold in between, you'll have this kind of smooth looking curve of a different balance between precision and recall. Note, similar in theory to this thing about ROC curve, but the units here are different. The things that we're looking on the X and Y axis are very, very different. And so we result in different ways of interpreting. I think the thing that always helps me is to think about what is this kind of two extreme? Where do those live on the graph? Remember for the, for the graph of true positive rate and false positive rate, those two extremes lived on different points of the graph. It's gonna help you visualize. And it's a bit confusing that we have a bunch of different graphs to look at, but different fields use different convention for what types of things they look at. And so here, if we have our t one threshold, our t zero, and then maybe somewhere in the middle, like our t five. Balance between precision and recall. And again, where is the right place to operate on this balance? This doesn't tell you. This just shows you as a graph different trade-offs between precision and recall when just using logistic regression and then trying to adjust which threshold you Okay, so we're almost wrapping up for today. There's just a couple other things I want to quickly show. So in this kind of precision recall curve, you could imagine I showed you this, this orange curve is the one I showed you before. That's like a standard thing. Now you'd imagine that the best classifier would be this blue line at the top. One that's always getting the like things it's predicting correct. It's a bit weird to think about the best set of models. In reality, the best model is this. Just had to consider one model. It's this one that has a precision of one and a recall of one. That gets every true example correct, having high precision. Oh, sorry, having high recall. And then of all the things that predicted correct, it was act or positive, it was correct, meaning it has high precision. This is in some sense the best possible model. What you might imagine is trying to show that model as a threshold, that changing the threshold for how often it's allowed to predict positive, it might decrease its have lower and lower recall, but its precision would still be high. In some sense, this is the best model. That even if you restrict it from making fewer and fewer positive predictions because you make it more pessimistic, it's still getting all of those things. So in some sense, this is an ideal model, but one you probably won't see in practice. In reality, you'll see models that look like orange line that show this kind of curve-like structure between precision and recall. And what you might do is you might look at different classifiers, different types of models, maybe a decision tree or maybe a logistic regression. And you might look at, okay, for different settings of this model, how does this affect, affect recall or precision? And you can imagine looking at these classifiers and identifying that, well, for any setting of how I threshold or how I make predictions, classifier B always has either a higher recall or a higher precision. There's no context we're using, when we just care about precision and recall, we're using classifier A would be better than using classifier B. Because for any setting of our threshold, classifier B has a higher precision or a higher recall. And so sometimes you might find graphs like this that help you eliminate classifier A from having worse precision recall. In general though, you'll see more of a mix and match where they sometimes cross over. And in that context, then it's not obvious which model is better. Because sometimes this model, classifier A, has higher recall, but in other times, this model over here has higher precision. And so different sets of classifiers with different levels of thresholds might perform better or worse for different sets. And in this case, you usually want up and to the right in the precision recall curve, because you want high precision and high recall. But in general, in some particular setting, you might not be able to decide, well, do I care? You might need to decide, do I care more about precision or do I care more about recall? And the use case, and we'll talk about different use cases here, kind of determine which space you want to be looking at. So in general, if you want that's greater than this level, you would probably want to use classifier A. 
But if you don't care about recall as much and you're okay using recall, then classifier C seems just fine. And is that, in fact, better if we operate that, operate a higher precision? Again, it depends on context, but these graphs can help you make. Okay, I promise we're almost done. I have one more slide for us, which is how to compare these classes. So I mentioned before, generally when people plot these things out, that could be useful, but they also sometimes come up with numeric descriptions for them. So you'll see lots of these, like these F1 score or AUC or et cetera. There are lots and lots of examples of different numbers that people try to use to summarize these graphs. We aren't going to focus too much on them. They're a little more domain specific on kind of how you interpret them when you use one versus the other. But I just want to mention you'll commonly see those numbers thrown around. It's because they're trying to describe that kind of graph in just a single number. And importantly, you need to identify what's important for your application. I'll mention one other type of common metric people use is what we call precision at K, which is you're allowed to make K positive predictions. So you're controlling how many positive predictions you're allowed to make. And then you ask of the ones you predicted positive, what's your precision? And we commonly call that precision at K. What's your precision when you predicted three things being? Um, and so in this context where I predicted five things being positive, my precision at five is 0.8 because I made one more five example. Okay, that was a whirlwind of things. Precision and recall. Note, at, a, at a, the lowest level, these are just error metrics we talked about. But these particular error metrics, precision and recall, I think have nice interpretable meanings. And we'll talk about in class today how they're applied in the context of our news case study document. Review. 